I grew up in Southeast South Dakota during the 70s and started farming on my own in 1985. Back then, uh, small grains were an important part of nearly everyone's crop rotation. My dad raised certified seed oats and uh, when I began farming, I carried on that tradition. Selling certified seed has encouraged me to uh, keep with small grains uh, uh, over the years. Um, I found that the, the premium that I can sell seed for has made small grains uh, very competitive with row crops for me. I farm near Freeman, uh, which is uh, Freeman, South Dakota, that's 30 miles straight north of Yankton and about 50 miles southwest of Sioux Falls. I farm with my wife and son. Uh, my son just graduated from Dort College. Um, he's going to be doing something else for several years, but uh, does express some interest in, in, in farming. Um, I also have a daughter who works in the tech industry in San Francisco. We uh, farm about 1,100 acres, um, 850 or so is crop ground. Um, I have a uh, herd of 50 shorthorn stock cows from which I'll sell calves and, and bred heifers. Um, we also have a flock of about 70 ewes and that's pretty much my wife's enterprise. Um, I'll grow winter wheat and oats um, and I plant small grains um, in uh, about a fifth of my acres will be small grains and I plant usually in a oats, soybean, uh, sorry, corn, soybean, corn, soybean, small grain. So each field will get a small grain crop about one out of five years. Um, I grow winter wheat and oats. I used to plant spring wheat, but I found that uh, I can produce a higher winter wheat yield that more than uh, compensates for the difference in market price. I've grown oats every year I've farmed, except for one year when the spring was just too wet to get it in. There are many reasons why I still grow small grains, but I'll summarize them in these uh, three main points. It's good for the crops, it's good for my bottom line, and it's good for my livestock. Corn and soybeans benefit from small grains in a variety of ways. Um, breaking up the row crop uh, weed and, and pest cycle is one really big reason that, that they will benefit. Um, the highly branched roots of small grains help to break up compaction and improve soil structure. Um, small grains and, and especially oats will in, increase the mycorrhiza populations and that all contributes to uh, better soil health. I usually estimate corn following a small grain crop to uh, have a yield advantage of about 10 bushels per acre compared to a, a corn soybean rotation uh, and soybeans maybe three to five bushels. I visited with uh, Dr. Pete Sexton, uh, an SDSU agronomist, about this and he thought maybe I was a bit generous but he said in their long-term rotation studies they've found a consistent yield uh, increase in corn following small grains of seven bushels and uh, maybe two to three on soybeans. So it's somewhere maybe in that range. <clears throat> um, when I prepare my crop budgets, I will credit that yield advantage or that yield enhancement back to the small grain crop because that's really where it comes from. Um, if you incorporate a cover crop, you can bump up your yields even more. Small grains give me an excellent window in the late summer to get a, a cover crop established and growing. Um, I have an account with farm logs and uh, just one of those free ones and they offered uh, uh, a free trial for crop health image on one field this year. And so I sort of randomly chose this field. Um, they had images from 2015 and this year. The 2016 images weren't available because of a technical issue that they had. 
But uh, you can see my crops in 2015. I had oats, corn, and winter wheat. Um, in looking at these, I stumbled across something really interesting. Uh, in 2016, I planted uh, soybeans here where there was corn and oats, and I followed the winter wheat with, with corn. Then in 2016, I just rotated uh, uh, corn and soybeans, and then, our, our, yeah, I'm sorry, in 2017 here, I rotated the corn and the soybeans. And you can see an exact line uh, in 2017 where there was oats in 2015. So that seems to indicate a rotational benefit two years later. Um, in the more recent picture here, that line is disappearing, but I'll be interested to take some yield checks there to see if it translated to yield. What's the crop? Oh, it's soybeans, corn, hay. This is the same. It's just it's the same field, yeah. Uh, in 2016, the slide I didn't, I don't have, I had soybeans here and corn here, and then this year I rotated. Um, aside from the agronomic benefits, small grains need to work for us economically. In my area, I hear many farmers tell me that they love to include a small grain crop uh, in their rotation, but it just doesn't make economic sense. Um, I believe it can make economic sense, um, especially if you look at small grains as part of an overall system and not just as a, a crop on its own, you know, a one-year crop. Some of the economic benefits are difficult to quantify, but they're real nonetheless. <clears throat> small grains help me diversify. An SDSU agronomist once said that we have row crop years and we have small grain years. Uh, once in a while we have uh, both crop years and rarely, but it does happen when we'll have a no crop year. A small grain can help provide uh, returns when a late summer drought will hammer the corn and soybeans. And it also provides some um, diversification in marketing. This summer, for example, uh, farmers were able to sell uh, spring wheat for over seven dollars and winter wheat uh, over five when the rally in corn and beans was modest at best. <coughs> Small grains help me spread out my workload. It's nice to have those acres harvested uh, in summer and I don't have to worry about them then during the fall harvest. Also planting uh, spring grains earlier in spring takes them out of the the corn and soybean planting crutch and helps me be more timely for my row crop acres. Straw can be an important source of additional income. There are many livestock producers who don't grow small grains and need straw. Um, straw yields are generally from one to two tons per acre depending on your variety and, and your cutting height. Um, current prices around me are about sixty dollars a ton so that's significant extra income. Remember though, you are removing uh, organic matter and some nutrients, so that all has to be factored in. <clears throat> Small grains tend to have lower input costs than corn and beans. Seed costs are lower. I use uh, less fertilizer and fewer and cheaper herbicides. Uh, this also helps risk management during a tough year. Small grains do mess up the weed and pest cycles, and that can save me some money in the row crop. Uh, one example, in, in uh, my area we have extended diapause with corn rootworm. That's where the corn rootworm eggs uh, have developed uh, a way to stay dormant an extra year, uh, and so that they'll continue to hatch in a corn soybean rotation. Um, if you include a small grain in there, that breaks that up and it saves me money on uh, insecticide or a rootworm product in the corn seed. Finally, raising small grains gives me some opportunity to capture uh, value in, in seed, um, but there's also possibilities in the area of food grains. Okay, this is the budget I handed out. It's a little bit hard to see up here, but um, 
I have my expenses on the left side, um, the variable cost and equipment cost, and then the returns per acre on the right. And I've done this for four crops, corn, soybeans, winter wheat, and oats. Um, just to highlight a couple of things, um, looking at total costs here uh, between soybeans and winter wheat, uh, very close, both just under $400 an acre. I found that to be typically true for me. Uh, soybeans and winter wheat costs about the same to produce. Uh, oats is the cheapest to grow. Um, seed costs are less. Um, uh, herbicide is quite a bit less. I use less nitrogen fertilizer. Um, you'll see I don't have a crop insurance there. Uh, with oats, the revenue protection is not available. Uh, also, the enterprise units are not available. So to me, uh, it's a little spendy for what I get, and so I self-insure my oats acres. Uh, the others all insure at the 70% level. Um, the yield goals on the right hand side up here uh, is what I expect on an average to good year. Um, and um, if you look at the bottom line here, wheat uh, looks the worst, um, but that's figured at $4. At $5 that would have looked better. Uh, I add in Below that, my, my seed premium, what I expect for selling seed, that's a per acre basis. And uh, also the, the yield enhancement I anticipate in the following row crop. I'll include that. And then you get to numbers which are uh, pretty competitive with, with the row crops, in, at least in my area. <clears throat> um, so back to your $25 figure. Mm -hmm. Is that just a random number you picked to throw in there, or do you have science behind that that tells you you got $25 yield bump? Uh, it's uh, personal experience over the years, and it's also based on uh, some SDSU uh, crop rotation studies where they're estimating. I used a, a seven dollar, uh, sorry, a seven bushel, uh, which is what they've been finding, uh, and this is you know. What, what we're finding in, in this part of South Dakota, um, where um, you have more rainfall, the yield advantage might be somewhat less, I don't know. But that's what, what I, I'm using um, and figuring, you know, $3 to uh, three and a half corn, something like that. For me, uh, small grains fit in very well with a farming system that includes livestock. There are benefits that accrue to the uh, small grain crop and vice versa. Um, and I'll say a little more about that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> these are the six key steps in producing a small grain crop. Uh, this is where I plan my strategy and um, uh, make my most important decisions. I'll touch on each one, uh, beginning with variety selection. I approach selecting varieties much the same as I do with uh, uh, selecting corn hybrids and soybean varieties. Um, I'll start with yield and, and yield stability. And look at variety trials across multiple locations over multiple years. Um, I'll pay attention to those trials closest to me and university trials have a lot of, of uh, research available. Uh, it's a good place to start. Uh, Iowa State uh, does trials, SDSU does trials. So um, the second thing I'll look at is maturity. Uh, this is uh, different maturing oats varieties. Um, I'll usually look for a mid uh, maturing variety and stay away from the really early or, or late ones. As, uh, as you go south, maybe earlier varieties might be a, a little better fit because they'll head out uh, ahead of um, the worst of the summer heat. Plant height is also something I'll look closely at because uh, I do go for straw. Um, I look for uh, medium to medium tall, maybe somewhere in that 33 to 35 inches. 
exceptionally tall varieties can lead to lodging. Uh, I did have a little lodging in my wheat field this, this year. Um, so lodging scores are important to me. And uh, there's really nothing more frustrating than trying to harvest a small grain crop that's laid down flat. One year I windrowed and combined an oats crop going only in one direction. And besides the time lost and uh, uh, also lost yield and test weight on that. Um, then of course pest resistance is very important. <clears throat> For winter wheat uh, I'm interested in, in resistance to rusts and, and uh, fusarium head blight or scab. Uh, with oats, uh, I look especially for crown rust, stem rust, and barley yellow dwarf virus or VYDV resistance. Um, barley yellow dwarf is uh, a, a virus that's carried by aphids and that can infect uh, wheat and oats both. Um, it's also called red leaf because you see the reddish color uh, of the leaves and it can cause severe uh, stunting of plants. Years ago, I grew a variety called High Test and had grown it successfully for a couple of years. And then we had a spring with a lot of aphids and it was a susceptible variety to this. And I had a severe infestation, so now I like to see at least some moderate resistance to BYDV. I need a winter wheat that can withstand the uh, South Dakota cold winters. Um, the biggest worry is extreme cold with no s snow cover. This here was actually ice from a rain we had last Christmas that uh, pooled in the low areas and froze, um, suffocated my, my uh, dormant seedlings. But fortunately it was just in a few of the lower areas and wasn't spread throughout the field like you have in a typical winter kill situation. <clears throat> um, I think I think winter hardiness would be important in Iowa as well, even though you're further south, uh, you maybe have, snow cover maybe lasts a little bit less long as well, and that's when, when the risk is the most, when it's cold and there's no snow. Finally, uh, in looking at varieties, grain quality is something to, to check. Uh, for wheat, um, test weight and protein are both very important. Elevators and millers will base a major part of their discount and premium schedule on protein content. And that does vary by variety. Um, <clears throat> environment plays a factor. If you have a, a droughty year with low yielding wheat, the protein tends to be higher. Um, also, uh, your nitrogen fertility will, will uh, influence it to some degree. Um, for oats, test weight is probably the biggest, biggest quality thing. Um, well over 90% of the oats milled in North, in North America is sourced from Canadian oats because they can produce consistent high quality. U.S. oats are used more for feed and forage. Um, when raising oats, I try to manage uh, as much as possible to produce high test weight. <clears throat> and that begins with variety selection because they, they will vary. Uh, the oats my son is holding here uh, is from the summer uh, was 38.5 test weight, which would be adequate for the food market. After you got your varieties, it's time to go planting. Um, I use a 20 foot Great Plains minimum till drill um, I have seven and a half inch row spacings and there's a, a coulter cart in the front that, that carries turbo till coulters that cut a slot to uh, uh, help me use it in, in some no-till situations. I will typically no-till winter wheat following soybeans and usually I till my oats ground. I like to plant winter wheat between September 20 and October 15. Earlier than September 20 carries some risk of wheat streak mosaic virus because the wheat curl mites that vector that disease are still active then. And uh, after October 15, there's not a lot of time for vegetative growth so you run some risk, uh, uh, it, a little bit more risk of winter kill. 
Um, also, yield potential tends to decrease as you get into later planting. I like to follow soybeans. Uh, wheat does not do quite as well following corn, and that's primarily because of uh, fusarium uh, blight or head scab. Um, it's my biggest wheat disease problem, and it's it's um, it's carried by the same fungus that causes corn uh, uh, stock rot in corn, and so it's very common in in, in uh, corn stalks. Um, if you cut silage, there's less residue on the surface, and so you can reduce your risk that way. Also, you can plant a little earlier. <coughs> I generally shoot for 1.2 million seeds per acre. A typical seed lot of wheat might have 12,000 seeds per, per pound. And so uh, dividing 1.2 million seeds per acre by 12,000 seeds per pound gives you about 100 pounds per acre planting rate. Uh, and I'll plant an inch and a half deep and in seven and a half inch rows. Oats, I have good luck following uh, corn and soybeans. Um, but the, the big thing to remember is the herbicides you use before that. This is true for wheat as well, but oats is especially sensitive to carryover. Um, two herbicides to be aware of that do carry over in oats is atrazine and pursuit. And these are herbicides that are also used in a lot of premixes, so um, it's good to be aware of what each component in a premix is. Um, so just check before you plant oats whether you can plant following the herbicides you, you use. It's something that's easy to forget about and I can attest to that from experience. Um, oats likes to be planted early. Uh, I go as soon as I can get in the field after about the middle or the 20th of March. Um, <clears throat> oats will have tillers better in cool weather and you can, you can get it to head out before it gets too hot and that'll help a lot with the yield and the test weight. Uh, again, I'll plant oats at an inch and a half deep. Oats likes a firm seed bed. Uh, before I had press wheels on my drill, I would harrow after planting to further firm the seed bed and cover any exposed seed. I use a seeding rate of two and three quarter to three bushels an acre. Small grains do respond well to fertilizer. Um, some farmers consider it to be a, a marginal uh, uh, a crop to um, a low input crop to use on your marginal ground. And there might be some benefit to that, but oats and winter wheat will, will yield well if you, if you give it enough fertilizer. Um, I'll use a <coughs> uh, 80 bushel yield gold generally and the recommendation is to take 2.5 pounds of nitrogen for your bushel yield goal, uh, subtract off your soil uh, nitrogen test and um, any legume credit. And um, I'll fertilize in a split application. <clears throat> Phosphorus and potassium is important for early season growth and for root development. Uh, so I'll put that down in the fall at planting time. Uh, with something like this 20, 40, 60, 5 sulfur blend. Um, winter wheat does not need much nitrogen in the fall, um, but uh, when it starts growing in spring, nitrogen uptake increases rapidly. So I will top dress in spring then somewhere in that 80 to 100 pounds of nitrogen and maybe put on a little more sulfur as well. Um, for oats, I've been using a 110 bushel yield goal, and the recommendation there is 1.3 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. I go usually a little bit less than that. Um, I, uh, my typical fertilizer for oats is about 80, 40, 40, 10 sulfur. Um, with uh, following soybeans, I might drop that back a little bit. Uh, with oats, excessive nitrogen uh, leads to some lodging in my experience, um, and this is especially true if you're a little low on uh, potassium and or, uh, or phosphorus. Really, you gotta have, you gotta allow, you know, get out there on 
The next step is disease and pest management. And uh, before talking about that, it's good to understand small grain growth stages. The main ones you hear is tillering, jointing, uh, the flag leaf, and the boot stage. Tillering is when uh, new stems come uh, off of the main stem. And here you can see a tiller just coming off the left side. Uh, they're attached to the main stem below the soil line. Each tiller has the potential to make a head. Um, jointing is when the stem elongates and starts to grow. <clears throat> the flag leaf is the last leaf that comes up on the top of the plant. I'm not sure which one it is here, but um, it sits on top of the stem kind of like a flag. Uh, it's the last leaf before the head emerges. The boot stage is when the head, after the flag leaf comes out and the head is here in the stem developing just before that comes out. Wheat and oats are very competitive with weeds. Um, the use of Roundup in corn and beans has really diminished uh, wheat, the wheat struggles that I had before in small grains. Um, downy brome or cheat grass can be a, a, an issue in winter wheat and this is especially true for no-tillers. Uh, here you can see some um, cheat grass in my field borders. It's a winter annual that germinates in fall along with the, with the winter wheat um, and then it'll head, head out in spring ahead of the winter wheat. It's pretty easy to control with uh, a chemical like PowerFlex, but the challenge is in fall the seedlings of cheatgrass and wheat look, look fairly similar. So uh, in spring it can be really hard to control. Um, it's something anyway to scout for and knowing your field with weed history can be helpful. <clears throat> Broad leaves such as lambs quarters, wild buckwheat, and kochia are my main weeds, and then I'll scout for perennials like field bindweed and Canada thistle. Wild oats can be a big problem in oats, um, but with my longer rotations and, and use of some, some Roundup in row crops, I've never had a problem with it. I don't use any grass herbicides. Um, the broadleaf herbicide I like is Bronate, which is a Bucktril plus M MCPA uh, premix. There's a number of gen generics available, Bison, Wildcard, there's others. Um, I'll use about a pint per acre on wheat uh, and oats, which is sensitive to everything. I'll cut that back to two thirds to three quarter uh, pint. I like Bronate because it's really effective on um, the small seeded broad leaves that will, uh, that, that I struggle with, kochia especially, also wild buckwheat. Um, I'll spray at the early jointing stage. Um, this is with, with wheat, it's somewhere around that 10th of May, and oats maybe around the third week of May. Um, try and get it done before it gets to the boot stage. Uh, Small grains are very sensitive to herbicides then. Uh, with oats you can cause blasting and that's when um, the bottom kernels of the panicle will abort. And I've sometimes used 2,4-D or Banville to try and ding perennials in my oats and uh, I have caused some blasting from that. So if you do use 2,4-D make sure you use it early and always use just the amine form. Uh, don't use esters on oats. <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, chemicals available for specific weed problems in wheat. Um, one thing though to be aware of is if you want to follow with a cover crop, uh, some of those products will, will carry over. For example, curtail can be really effective on Canada thistle in winter wheat, but it can be damaging to any broadleaf cover crops that you follow with. The diseases I'm concerned about in winter wheat are tan spot, the rusts, and scab. Uh, there's three kinds of rust, stripe rust, leaf rust, and stem rust. I'm not very good at distinguishing between them, but uh, management is similar. Um, if I plant a resistant variety, I can usually get by without a fungicide where I live. 
Uh, sometimes I'll throw in a little bit of fungicide with the herbicide and that helps with something like tan spot or early leaf diseases but uh, it's really too early to control the rust. So you want to protect that flag leaf. The flag leaf is what really contributes to your yield. Um, it said that 60 to 70 percent of your grain leaf of your grain yield is generated from the flag leaf. Um, I would guess that maybe with wetter and more humid conditions in Iowa, um, you might have more issues with rust. Um, so that would be something to, to really scout for. Um, my big disease is, is Fusarium head blight or uh, head scab. Um, that will infect the heads at, flower, oops, at flowering time. And that's when these uh, yellow anthers will emerge from the head. Um, heads that are infected will get bleached and pinkish. Um, it might be just part of the head, a few blooms. It might be the bottom half or the top half. Or on the right side, it might be the whole entire head. Inside those infected blooms, the uh, seed gets shriveled and kind of chalky white. Um, uh, these chalky white kernels here are called tombstone kernels. And so you can kind of see the difference between a healthy sample. Um, The, the one problem with scab, of course, is that development of mycotoxins and, and uh, non or vomitoxin. Um, if you have a lot, of, a lot of this, that can be a problem. And if there's scab in the area, elevators will start testing for it. Um, if, if they find toxins in your wheat, it can be difficult to market. <clears throat> I've had several years with quite a bit of scab in my wheat, so now I routinely use a fungicide uh, and in addition to looking for varietal resistance. Fungicides can be really effective, but the timing is very critical. There's a narrow window. Um, the, uh, the, middle pic the middle picture, uh, the middle head in the picture is the ideal time for spraying wheat scab. There's the anthers are just starting to come out. The head on the left uh, has emerged but isn't flowering yet. That's too early. The head on the right uh, is already done. The anthers are drying up and drying off, dropping off. That's too late. Um, it looks simple in a picture. Uh, when you're out in the field, it's a little more complicated because the wheat heads emerge at different times. Um, they don't all start flowering at the same time. Um, it takes a little time to get the spray rig out to the field, so I usually look for 10% of flowering. And when I see that, then I'll pull the trigger on a spray. Um, it's better to be a little bit on the early side than too late. I like to use Folicure, a uh, generic form of that, Tevucure, um, um, that has given, it's cheap. It's given me adequate control, especially combined with a resistant variety. Uh, Prosaro and Caramba uh, might give, uh, they, they would be even more effective. Uh, they're, they're more expensive. If you have a susceptible variety or if you have a forecast of uh, a wet forecast, that they might be worth looking at. Uh, one thing to remember, uh, don't use strobilurin fungicides after heading. Uh, um, they can make a scab situation worse. They'll cause an antagonism in the, in the head uh, with the microorganisms that will um, uh, increase the vomitoxin level. So back to that, when you said it's difficult to market them once they have the scab, what do you do? You, don't, you can't feed it to animals, right, because of those toxins? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I've, I've never... Uh, uh, had a problem marketing. I think you just you have to get it blended down enough that it good it, stuff. It, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing for seed, uh, uh, the fungi does not store real long in seed, so um, over storage, it will it will uh, it will affect germination much less. And then you can always use um, 
uh, seed treatment too that will help for scabby kernels. Um, this is a, a SDSU uh, book that I refer to a lot. It's updated each year. Uh, the URL I have on your budget uh, handout so you don't have to print it out. You can download that for free. Um, oats diseases. Um, my main one is crown rust. Um, <coughs> I use tilt for that and um, it seems like varieties don't keep their resistance as long as they used to. Uh, the rust rate shifts. Um, and so that's been a difficult one to, um, to get ahead of. Uh, I, have, I always used to just use resistant varieties. Now I spray fungicide as a matter of course. Spray it at the boot stage. Uh, here you can see the flag leaf sticking on the top. Um, once oats is all headed out, it's too late. And uh, you want to protect that flag leaf again. Uh, tilt is the chemical that I, I like to use. Stratego and Headline are also, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of good fungicides that, that will help with crown rust. Um, harvesting is a time I, I really enjoy. Um, it comes around late mid to late July for me. And the first trick is determining when the crop is ready. Um, I want to see no green in the heads or, or in the crop and uh, when I thresh out the heads the, the seed is hard and dry then I'll cut in with the combine and take a moisture test. Uh, small grains need to be stored at 13% at or under in order to store well. So um, Wheat usually stands really well. It doesn't shatter, so you can generally take it straight. Uh, I use a, a soybean head uh, and, and cut it straight. You might want to lock up the cutter bar so it's rigid uh, and doesn't float. Um, I, on, on this head, there's straps that you can do that with. I usually go by the combine manual settings, uh, at least to start with. Um, I change to narrow wire concaves for small grains, but you can get by with the corn and soybean concaves. Wheat needs to be threshed a little harder than oats with a little higher fan speed. Uh, sometimes it helps to close down the shoe sieve a little bit in the combine for wheat in order to get the white caps or the little pieces of uh, unthreshed heads out. I like to swap oats. Um, I've started experimenting with straight cutting because my wind rower is starting to uh, get old and fall apart. Um, the advantage to swathing is that you can take the oats down a little earlier at a little higher moisture content and avoid some risk to standability. I'll start swathing when the oats looks com completely ripe across the top of the field, but there might be a little bit of green in the lower, lower panicle. Um, let it lay for two, three days, and it should be dry enough to combine. For straight cutting, I don't want to see much green at all in there. And again, the grain moisture content is, is the best judge of what, whether it's ready. Um, for straight cutting oats, it helps to have a uniform field uh, with, um, with a crop that matures uniformly. If harvest comes during a really wet, humid stretch, I might take it at a little higher uh, moisture content and put it in a bin with a drying floor and blow some air. Um, it's really helpful to have that option. Um, also, wheat harvest can be hot, and the grain is hot, and it gives you the opportunity to cool it down on a cool night. <coughs> uh, marketing. That's the last step, but that's actually something that's good to start with exploring in the very beginning. Um, my primary market is for seed. I'll sell directly to uh, um, other farmers, but mostly I'll sell to a seed house that will um, condition and clean the seed and then retail it to other, uh, other farmers. What doesn't get sold for seed is generally I sell in the local grain markets. 
Our local elevator will buy winter wheat and uh, spring wheat, um, but they only buy oats for a short period of time during harvest. I've sold oats to local livestock producers and some nearby feed mills. Um, other options are, are possibilities to explore is the food market. Uh, grain millers are here in, in Iowa at St. Ansgar and uh, they process wheat and oats. Um, selling to the food market or the seed market requires some extra attention to detail because both of those have quality standards that you have to meet. Uh, and it's good to have a backup plan in, course, in case you can't meet those standards. <clears throat> there, uh, for both food and seed, it's quality and purity. Those are the things that they look for. Uh, but there are some differences. The food market emphasizes test weight, protein content, and milling quality. Um, the seed market looks at germination and varietal purity. There's no test weight standard for seed, uh, but test weight can affect germination uh, indirectly. The food market has a higher tolerance for weed and, and crop seeds. Um, and the other thing to remember for seed is that nearly all varieties now available are pr protected by the Plant Variety Protection Act. And that means you can save the seed and plant it on your own fields, but you can only sell it uh, to somebody else as a class of certified seed. So if you want to uh, sell seed, work with your state crop improvement association. Small grains work well with my livestock operation and there's benefits that go both ways. Um, straw, I need straw for my cattle uh, and the sheep and the small grains provided. I can spread uh, manure there after taking the straw off and replace some of those nutrients. Um, Oats makes an excellent forage crop for cattle. Here I'm cutting uh, a, a nurse crop of oats. Uh, use oats in my, um, oats is great for starting cattle. Uh, it has a high hull and fiber content. I'll creep feed calves and I'll, I'll use, uh, blend oats with my corn when I wean. Um, we also use it in our lamb rations mixed with corn. A big advantage to growing small grains is opportunity to raise a cover crop and benefit from the increased uh, soil health and the livestock feed that that provides. In designing a cover crop, it's good to um, determine what your goals are. If it's primarily for grazing, a grass mix will give more production. If you want to benefit the corn, a cool season broadleaf uh, has the most benefit. I use a, uh, a mix. I try to have some of both, some grazing and some crop benefit. Um, I'll plant uh, turnips, forage radishes, um, canola, lentil, and a forage sorghum, uh, about 20% of each. Um, if following oats, I'll often leave the sorghum out because there's a lot of oats regrowth um, that will provide, the volunteer oats will provide the grass portion in there. And, and sorghum needs to be managed a little bit carefully because the frost will cause it to produce prussic acid, which can be harmful or, or fatal even to cattle. And so if you have a frost, you wanna get the cows off for about a week and then you can let them back in. Um, Planting the cover crop, I want to seed it as soon as possible after harvest. The sooner the better. Get it established early. Uh, give it time to grow. Uh, give it time to catch a rain for germination. Um, the, uh, the mix I use, I plant about 14 pounds an acre and it cost me $1.25 a pound this year. There's a lot of flexibility in how you can graze cover crops. I usually turn the cows out in late uh, October. If the field is close to home where they can have access to heated waters, I'll wait till maybe even late December. Uh, the tubers of radish and, and turnips can provide a lot of feed value even well after freeze up. 
my target is to manage grazing, uh, let them graze half and leave half. Um, sometimes <clears throat> they're having such fun out there, it gets a little bit more than that, but um, that's the target. And for my mix, I found that usually I can raise one dry cow for one month on an acre. So a 40 acre field of co cover crop, I can run 40 cows for a month. Okay, um, small grains continue to be an important part of my operation. Good for the crops, good for my bottom line, and it's good for my livestock. But the way I include small grains on my farm um, is what has been, has and what has been working for me. And I know that uh, that's maybe not the same for everybody. Everybody's situation is different and unique. And so I encourage you to take what you heard and consider what parts of it might work in your operation and, and what things may not. Uh, with that in mind, I'd be happy to answer any questions. That, uh, what was that cover crop you mentioned that you used, that mixture, and then you use that every year, same thing? Uh, I have been using that pretty much every year with uh, uh, some minor changes. One year I had some sunflower in there, and uh, this year I took the sorghum out because because uh, it was on oats double. So. And, uh, what, what was that combination again? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the combination of the cover crop that I planted, uh, <clears throat> forage radishes, uh, purple top turnip, uh, lentils, uh, canola, and uh, sorghum sudan. Yeah. What's your average rainfall? My average rainfall is in that uh, 26, 27 inch range. So um, we're, uh, we're quite a bit drier than, than this area. Yeah. Back to your cover crop ratio. Can you, I'm new to a lot of this. Can mm -hmm. you explain why you chose each that like sorghum, radish? Why did you choose each one of those? Um, yeah. Why did I choose each component? Um, the, uh, the the brassicas, which are the the, the canola, the um, the turnips, and the radish. Um, the big benefit of them is their cool season. Uh, broadleaves and that's a crop that that we don't have in our mix at all we have we have uh, warm se season grass and corn uh, we have warm season broadleaf with soybeans uh, our, our small grains are cool season grasses we don't have any cool season broadleaves uh, that seems to really benefit corn um, just having that in the in the rotation um, turnips and radish uh, they have deep tap roots. They'll help with the compaction, and and the cows just love the, the tubers. I mean, it takes them. They <clears throat> they have to learn. Uh, they they eat down the tops, and uh, and then after a while, uh, they'll they'll find the tubers, and and once they get a taste for them, they really like them. Um, the lentils are in there mostly for nitrogen fixation. Um, I don't know how much good they do, but uh, I do include them for that. Um, and, and the cattle will eat them as well. Um, the sorghum sedan, uh, that's for the grazing. Uh, the grasses do provide quite a bit more production. Uh, there's a lot of water in the broad leaves. Uh, the cattle, if you have just a broad leaf mix, it's good to have some hay um, as well. Um, and then the, the cows will kind of self-regulate what they need. Other questions? Have you tried any uh, grazing any clovers or alfalfa? Uh, you, those you can plant when you plant the oats? Uh, yeah. Um, it's something I'm interested in. I'd love to be able to do red clover. Um, the problem is for, for seed I got to keep the weeds out and we have a real problem with kochia without weed control. And the second thing, maybe a little lesser problem, but still an issue, um, would be do we have enough moisture to grow both? Uh, so those are the two things, but the concept I like a lot, um, but I have not done it. You reduce your fertilizer input for the following crop, any? 
grades that cover? Um, I haven't. I maybe could. Um, I um, I will if I've spread manure there. Um, I don't have enough manure to cover all my my uh, small grain acres, but where I do, uh, I'll cut back. And what I really like is to let the cover crop get about four inches tall or so, and then just spread the manure on top of that. Um, it seems to uh, work well, and and they'll get some benefit out of it, and it helps recycle it. And so, yeah, yes. So when you're grazing that cover crop, are you grazing it in the spring, or are you able to graze it that fall? No, I graze it in fall. Yeah. Do you get enough growth on that to do that? Most years I do, um, but you need some rain in August to get it there. Um, um, I think we'll be all right this year. We had a rain here just a uh, couple nights ago, um, or actually yesterday it was. So um, uh, yeah, usually there's there's enough production that uh, I can graze it. And, pardon? It's behind oats and wheat. You're doing right, it's behind oats and wheat. So I'm 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 starting it uh, very end of July or or maybe that first week of August, but hopefully I can get it in oh, so in it's July. Not a September, October it's, that you're seeing. Right, that. exactly, right exactly, okay. exactly. I was thinking you just didn't get enough growth on that. Yeah, yeah, no, no. And then do you how you said you graze half of it? When do you pull the cow? Um, about a month. Uh, well, so mid October it, to mid November, right? Before it right. starts getting cold and snowy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because then, and that all depends on your situation. You know, if you've got uh, uh, water and 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 what you know, um, that gets to be my my issue later in fall is the water. Water um, tank heater. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. In your budget, if you didn't have that seed cream. Um, it would be tougher and I would really look at the food market um, or some way to get to get some additional or you know if maybe if you feed it or, or something like that um, it, the margin is is uh, much closer a lot of years and and it varies you know um, um, now with with corn and soybeans really cheap uh, it's probably a little closer than when corn was, you know. All these numbers are negative. Five. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I was a little surprised that the herbicide costs for the winter wheat were higher than for the oats. I think I would expect that because you've got that ground cover on there for longer, you have more wheat suppression in the winter wheat. What do you think is going on there? Is it just that the tillage before the oats is? Um, what's really going on there is I use the same product between the two, um, but, but oats um, I don't want to put on at the full rate because it's sensitive, so I cut that back a little bit. Um, and um, I think the wheat is a little more... Uh, um, aggressive, um, especially winter wheat, you know, where it starts real early in spring. So I'm sure I could get by with the same rate, but I <clears throat> don't take any chances with seeds. So <laughs> that's basically my reasoning. Yeah. Have you uh, looked at or uh, tried any sort of like chicken litter or turkey litter uh, on your small range? Uh, I have not. Um, I don't know that there would be a source of that close to me. Um, um, I don't really have any any experience with that. I don't know. Does anybody else use chicken litter?
about sheep, but uh, do you graze the sheep on those as well? No, uh, I sure could, but we don't. Um, um, <clears throat> my my wife likes to uh, manage their feed really careful at that time because she flushes them uh, before breeding, and and so um, and and the. Um, the acreage I have is, is barely enough for my cows is the other reason, but uh, um, sheep would do, would do well on that, yeah. Did you say you had 40 or 50 cows that you had? 50, 50, yeah, yeah, right. So what kind of containment do you use for your cattle? Do you just have an electric fence go around, or how do you, call, um, how do you keep them in there? Right, uh, how do I keep my cows in? Um, in a lot of cases, it's electric fence. Um, some fields I have barbed wire fence, but uh, less and less all the time. Because <laughs> if you're running a line for your electric, you can run a line for your tank heater. <coughs> True. You True. Water but out there. Yeah, yeah. But I usually use battery fencers. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use your own grain for your seed? Uh, do I use my own grain? Yeah, to reseed. Mm -hmm. uh, not for, for seed production because to plant certified seed, I need to start with. A class earlier, which is called registered, uh, and the the first one is foundation. So what I'll do sometimes is buy foundation seed, and then I'll sell uh, the registered, which usually you get the same price as as certified, uh, but I'll keep that back, and then I can plant that again and sell certified. But then that's the last generation. So. Well, all those cover drop cover crops. So the following spring you go to corn after that cover crop, right? Do right. You have, that, do you have to kill, do all those winter kill, or? Uh, yeah, usually they will. Uh, the canola is the one that sometimes uh, will, will overwinter. Um, uh, the, the turnips and radishes and lentils and, and the sorghum, that all, that all kills out. And the problem with canola is it's a non-roundup uh, canola that they use, but um, there's been a little bit of mixing, so there'll be a little bit of canola in there that if I spray Roundup, it'll survive that. Um, but it's just a few plants, I see. It's not a big deal. So then do you do tillage? You don't do any tillage after your, between your cover crop and your corn? What sort of oh, tillage? okay, okay. Between the cover crop and the corn, I will till that. Uh, so if I go to corn, that's right. Uh, and that takes care of it. What, um, what implement do you use? One implement, uh, one pass? Yeah, one implement, one pass. Um, uh, I'll, I'll usually use a disc, or I have no tilled corn in that. That's, that's right. I did, I did do that uh, actually two years ago. I no tilled corn in there, and, and that worked well. Um, but um, generally, generally, I till my corn ground, and I'll no till soybeans in the corn stalks. That's kind of how my practice has been. Are you using your cattle then as they, as you move through your harvest, are you letting them, you know, forage through your corn and your bean fields as well? No, no, I, <clears throat> I haven't done that. Um, um, they're on pasture until, until fall after, um, are you talking about after harvest? Right. So yeah, yeah, after, after harvest crop, I do. And then you Correct. Do you yeah, I'm sorry. Into those other fields? Yeah, I will. Do I will you graze them. Do you count any of that nitrogen from those cows grazing? Does that help you at all on your nitrogen needs? Um, I have never factored that in. Um, you know, theoretically, it probably helps a little bit. Uh, I have not heard any um, research or suggestions about what. Related to that, do you soil test, or how often do you soil test? Um, I'll soil test uh, pretty much every other year, um, and and I'll usually soil test where I'm going with small grains and where I'm going with corn, and um, then where I I don't test the corn stock ground because that that'll be in beans, and I <coughs> so it's every other year. This is the conventional soil test. You're not trying to test for any of your biological activity. Correct. Correct. Right.